So now we've covered a lot of theoretical stuff, a lot of practical stuff uh, with regard to what we can do to, to reopen and get back to business, get our economies going again. But for our final um, session today, we'd like to look at the nuts and bolts. So we've touched on health protocols all along, and these are critical to enable our sector to open again. So our next panel um, will be moderated by Doris Parsons from SRC, uh, currently based in Rwanda, but also operational in Tanzania. Um, and I will allow Doris to start the conversation and um, introduce her panel, whom are three experts in the various sectors of either eventing and health and, and safety protocols. So Doris, over to you, thank you. Wonderful, thank you so very much, Tess. Um, uh, it's a privilege and honor for me to be part of this very insightful summit. And I'd like to just say thank you to the speakers and the panelists and the moderators that have come before us. I mean, I didn't think I was gonna be here from the moment it started, but look, I have been locked in from the very beginning. And yeah, thank you so very much, very insightful. Now, I would like to appreciate each of you who have taken time to join us today. We're so very excited to have people join in from all over the world. Some of you have joined from the very moment this summit started four hours ago, and hey, I was one of them. So <laughs> thank you so very much. Well done, Tess and the rest of the team for putting this together. Um, well, you've heard the saying, saving the best for last. So this being the final session today, and uh, we have an incredibly vocal and passionate panel each of whom extremely influential speakers whenever they have the platform. And today we are privileged to have them all on the one platform. I'm certainly looking forward to an exhilarating, um, well, 45 to 60 minutes of insightful conversations with each and every single one of them. And like everybody else, I am ready to learn as I've learned from all the other sessions. I'm sure it's gonna be uh, quite informative. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists for this session. We have four extremely, Sarah extremely, Charles. hello? Oh, okay. <laughs> we have three very, very, very powerful speakers and it's my pleasure to start introducing each one of them now. And first I will start with the lady in this panel that is Linda Pereira. Linda is the senior partner and CEO of the LNI Communications Group. In addition, to her long and respected career as one of the most influential voices in the meetings industry, she is also the executive director of CPL Events. I had the pleasure and honor of meeting Linda earlier this year, and I can tell you this, I was drawn to her, so I can imagine all of you today, we look forward to her session today. Linda is also an entrepreneur, an international consultant, a trainer, and a strategic event communication strategist and she's recognized as one of the most influential global voices in her industry. We are privileged to have you, Linda. Thank you for joining us. And next we have Mike Lord. Mike is the Managing Director of Alliance Safety Management and Alliance Venue and Facilities Management. He has over 22 years experience in event management, venue management, and safety and security consultancy services. So he's very well placed in this session today. Mike will share with us the kind of health and safety protocols that the tourism and travel industry stakeholders need to consider as we open for business. Now I know a lot has been spoken on in terms of health and safety, but our session today is gonna to focus on the nitty gritty, the real hands-on things that we need to put in place. Mike also uh, manages, his, manages his own event management consulting services, concentrating on event management services, venue management, and safety and disaster planning services. Why am I saying this? Because we've spoken a lot about airlines and airlifts and airports, but we do need to also speak about the other areas of the industry, and this is where Mike is going to come in. Mike, pleasure having you join us. We look forward to hearing what you have to share with us. And last but not least, we have Dr. Peter Tarlow. Dr. Tarlow is a founder and president of Tourism and More Incorporated. He is also a world-renowned speaker 
and experts specializing in areas such as um, the impact of crime and terrorism in the tourism industry. He also speaks on event and tourism risk management and economic development. Peter has also worked with the US government and international agencies such as the FBI, the UN uh, WTO, the Center for Disease Control, and that is just to name a few. Now, Peter's CV is like out of this world. We, we're not even going to go there. But all I can say is Peter has experience speaking throughout North and Latin America, the Middle East and Europe. And one of the very interesting topics that Peter has been speaking on recently has been one of creating COVID resilience zones, which he will talk to us, well, which he will talk about today. He has recently been speaking on how communities and businesses must face a major paradigm shift in the way they do business. And I think that conversation is extremely relevant in the times that we are facing right now. Peter, wonderful to have you join us. Thank and you. we look forward to hearing your insights. So let's get on to the business that has brought us here today. We've all been here for a pretty long time. So I guess we're all looking forward to getting started. Now, COVID-19 has happened to the world. We get it, okay? Unexpected and unplanned. None of us thought that we'd be considering new ways of doing business that are completely drastic. It has been a drastic change. And that has now we're getting used to the idea that it's going to be a new normal. Now, actions that we never gave a second thought to sometime last year could now very well make or break future business opportunities, particularly in the tourism and travel industry. Now, as countries around the world are gradually beginning to restart tourism, we're also seeing measures in place to ease uh, to ease lockdown and travel restrictions. And we've heard a lot about that from previous speakers. But the question is, how do we actually go about it as an individual, a business owner or DMC? Or how do we go about it? What health and safety protocols should we put in place? And again, we've heard a lot about it, but from the speakers we have today, we're going to hear about it from, a, from their perspective, which is, I would imagine, a little bit different from everyone else who has spoken before them. So these are some of the questions our panelists will be addressing this afternoon, and I hope the conversations we have today will get us all on the path to recovery for our businesses and for organizations and indeed for the travel industry. Now, let us start with our questions. My first question today, I'll just put a little bit of a, a small, uh, a short uh, overview on how we, we even got here in the first place. The impact of COVID-19 has changed our lives. We all know this, I mean, that is undebatable. The impact of COVID-19 has changed our lives. It has changed travel, it has changed tourism as we know it. We have seen businesses in the industry come to a grinding halt as a result of the impact. Travel has come to a complete standstill and all the events in the 2020 calendars have been wiped out. We didn't see it coming. In the beginning of the year, we did not see it coming, but here we are. And we can attest all this to one thing, fear, fear of the virus. So fear has literally brought the world to its knees. So my first question, Linda, I'm gonna address it to you, if you don't mind. Now, in your opinion, what exactly is it that business and leisure travelers worry about or fear about most when it comes to traveling again. And I ask this because, you know, from, from an overview, we can say, yes, they have fear, they've got a fear of that, and they've got a fear of this. But if someone is in the session today who is maybe a, a DMC or an incentive planner, they need to understand what exactly a travelers, what is their, what, what, what do they fear? Because if we don't have a grasp of what their real fears are, we cannot begin to address it fully. Linda, please share with us your views. What is it that they fear? Okay, thank you, Doris. Hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me. It's a great honor to be here surrounded by such amazing people. Um, okay, if you had asked me this question yesterday, <laughs> I would have had a different answer from today. At yeah. the moment, I'm sitting in a country where, because we have three public holidays that fall on this particular week, our hotels are currently at 80% full 
which has told me that a lot of people have traveled, which is really nice to hear for the industry at the moment. But let's say, I've been talking to, I work with the, the business confederations mm -hmm. and uh, all over Europe. And, um, and the fact is that companies, more, it's fear, yes, but more than fear, it's, um, it's issues of, of duty, issues of insurance and the issues of compliance. Mm -hmm. Remember that corporates have duty of care and du duty of care carries heavy burdens. And of course, they're not going to send their staff just like that. And even when we open up, you're not going to get people sending their employees, 10 employees, 20 employees. You're going to see reductions in the number of employees that get sent out in representation, representation of a company. And also what I'm hearing from a lot of corporates and associations is the fact that countries are applying security measures and lockdowns and all of the trappings at different rates and at different levels. Even if you look just at a small, a small zone like Europe, each country is at a different level at this time. The UK is at one level. The north of Europe never truly went into lockdown. So that's a whole other story. Then you have Spain, which is next door to us, where they have this tremendous chaos. And then you have Portugal, where the moment the government said, go home, everybody went home. And that was it. No conversation, no argument. Everybody went home, everything stopped. The moment the, the, the government said, everyone has to follow the rules, everyone followed the rules. And we've been out of lockdown for a month. Everything seems to be going well. We're back to events, we're back to concerts, our restaurants are open, our mm -hmm. businesses are open, and we're not seeing any increase in cases. We've got really, really, really strict laws in place and rules in place. And what we found is that at the moment, Portugal is the number one destination that people want to fly to. Mm -hmm. Every um, bridge that has been set up, because we have now got air bridges with uh, a few places, sells out in minutes. And this, is, this is, has shown that when you put the rules in place, when you, when you go out of your way to communicate those rules mm -hmm. when you make sure yeah. that there is inspection and validation in place for example we started with the clean and safe um, seal that companies have to apply for companies have to test they have to show that their staff is trained they have to demonstrate demonstrate not just say demonstrate that they know the rules uh, masks are absolutely obligatory in the streets. The moment you leave your house, you're wearing a mask. Masks, you cannot enter any, any location without a mask. It's the law, it's the rule. And once you are communicating these rules, mm. people suddenly who are, they're in this state and they suddenly begin to relax just a little. And, and right. it's, about, it's about creating trust. I think it's the same everywhere. We're looking yes. at the UK at the moment. And the problem in the UK at the moment is trust. There's no trust in the way the government is implementing the rules. People are mistrustful of the way that the rules are applied. And this begins a wave of, so I think it's very much us all as influencers that are going to start creating trust in the client, yeah. in the corporate yeah. and in the business. So from what I hear you say, Linda, is I like the point where you said you have to go out of your way to communicate. We can see other countries, maybe in Africa or anywhere else, they may very well be putting very you know, great measures and protocols in place. But if they're not communicating it aggressively, consistently, then no, the trust is never going to be gained. Trust cannot come by itself. It comes as a result of what you were saying about what it is you're doing. So wonderful point right there. Um, shall I take this to Peter? Peter, what are your views? What, what is it that people, uh, or rather travelers, are afraid of? I mean, over and above uh, the insurances and over and above, what, what else are people afraid of? So we can begin to address these fears. Sure. Well, first of all, I want to build on what Linda was saying. Um, mm -hmm. I know Portugal extremely well. I, my first PhD was in Portuguese history. I'm fluent in Portugal. I spent Ooh. lots of time in Portugal. 
and oh, I run a center. Boa tarde. Obrigado. A gente pode falar depois em português. So uh, I I so I understand Portugal really. I teach Portuguese history in Portugal, so um, so I, so I know it well. Um, Portugal had a tremendous advantage, and that is that it was a country that had trust right from the beginning. Its police are well organized, the country itself is well organized, and so when Linda speaks about creating trust, and she's a thousand percent right. Some of the factors that exist in Portugal do not exist in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And that becomes part of the issue. So for example, in too many parts of the world, people do not trust their police departments. Mm -hmm. In too many parts of the world, people do not trust their government. And therefore, where you don't have trust, you do have fear. So that means that you have to begin to start with basics. Now we're having too much information that's given without logic and just being thrown out. For example, uh, yesterday was in a conference where people were saying, well, once we have a vaccine, everything will be okay. Well, it's not gonna be okay. The bottom line is, and I teach in a medical school, that this virus has already gone through 12 different mutations. By the time we get a vaccine out, we're gonna need multiple vaccines. Uh, it's very similar in some ways to the flu, and flu vaccines are often no more than 60% effective, and we've been doing those for 40 years. So to believe that we're going to have a panacea is leading the public to lose trust because we're offering something which is not necessarily correct. What we're going to have to work on is showing people that if they do get ill, we have a system to be able to do it. So one, first of all, I'm a strong believer that when you have a honest, functioning, good police department and other public services, that builds the trust that gets people out of fear. Fear is only the opposite of trust. They're really one and the same. Yeah. Two, we're going to have to actually have data. For example, in Africa, how many people know, how many hospitals do we have that have ventilators? How quickly can we get you there? What happens if someone comes to the place and then gets sick? And do we send them home? Do we take care of them? What, are, what, are, are, what is the methodology that we're going to use in order to face these types of issues? So we need to have basic material. And again, when Linda spoke about Portugal, Portugal has all that. I know literally almost every police department in the country, in Portugal, where they're trained and how they're trained. So the trust factor is a very different factor in Portugal than in some other parts of the world. Three, we're going to have to begin to show, to have true resilience, make sure that our doctors are trained in all sorts of infectious diseases. Too many people come out of medical school and they know a little of this or they know a little of that, but they don't know quite how to deal with issues on a national scale. And that means ministries of health have got to work with ministries of tourism. They can't be going each in their own direction. They have to be an internal coordination that's going to allow people to understand that if I come to your place and I discover I'm sick, what's going to happen? And by the way, that's not just COVID-19. That means that we have to, hospitality is related to the word hospital. They both come from the basic Latin root to take care of. When someone comes to our country, to our community, to our place, we have to make sure that we're going to take care of them. So if the person has a uh, needs a blood transfusion, do we have proper blood? Do we have the uh, formats of producing needles and, uh, that are going to be clean and we're not gonna get somebody sick? Mm -hmm. Those basic qualities have got to be seen and they create the trust that's going to allow. Right. So- Thank you very much, yeah. Thank you, I don't wanna take too much uh, of everything. <laughs> I yes, I've got so many questions coming, but thank you very much. I like what you said about trust. I mean, fear being the complete op opposite of trust. Right. And, you know, I like to, I use fear as an acronym, false evidence appearing real. Once you, right. it's just, you know, whatever, it's, it's just people's perception. You know, if you want to change their perception, then you've got to provide the data. You've got to provide the numbers. You've got to provide exactly what is happening. And I would say as an African is that Africa, does have data where data is concerned africa does have it. the question is 
They're not telling us what they have. So as a result, trust goes right out of the window and it is affecting the industries in more ways than we could ever imagine. Um, Mike, thank you for joining us. What is your take on this? I know you are an expert in, in health and safety from a particular, from, a, from a, an opposite industry. What are, what are your views here? What is it that people fear, especially when it comes to the event industry? And now we're talking about, you know, the buyers, the people that we're trying to gain their confidence back to come back to our venues, to come back to our destinations. Do you share the views that Peter and um, Linda have shared with us? How, what could you add to that? Yeah, th thanks, Doris. I appreciate um, uh, being invited and, and, and being able to speak. Uh, you know, unfortunately, sitting at the bottom end of the world in South Africa keeps us a bit isolated from, from what's happening around the rest of the world. Um, so you're always trying to gather information about where you are, you're partnering with people, you're listening to people, and, and then you're applying what you're hearing where you, where you, have, where, where you have the information. And, and the abundance of information is quite scary. Uh, we have now time to read, which maybe we didn't have before. I mean, one of the things that, that everybody touched on is the, the trust factor. We've always had that as event organizers. Um, public trust us to put things together for them that looks after their safety, and that is something that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. I think what uh, COVID-19 has created is what are we doing and how are we doing it? And, and, and what are the systems we have in yeah. place already? And how do we adapt those to take this into account? So whether, you know, whether we face terrorism, whether we face, you know, whatever, whatever comes into our environment and, and events are so multidimensional uh, across the spectrum that we have to be prepared. So the idea of having, you know, protocols and, and systems is critical to, to surviving this. The, the trust and level of comfort we have to produce is, is now in our hands um, and we can't ignore that. The one positive that I'm seeing coming out of, out of all of this is, is that people are talking. I am, am able to get on the phone to anybody in the world and talk to them. Um, and, and, and the collaboration is, is, is unbelievable. And we're so frenzied every other day of our lives that this allows us an opportunity to just kind of reset where, where we are and allows us to kind of rethink how, how we go forward. And, and for me, that, that's a huge positive uh, you know, in, 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 in this whole environment. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that, Mike. Um, following on on what you've just said, um, as we all know and agree, health and safety will very much be part of the new normal. I mean, it is what it is. Now, there's one thing. Host countries need to protect themselves from incoming visitors as much as they need to protect those who are, in fact, hosting. I'm not going to mention any name or any country name, but there are countries that have opened up and we see that there's no, we're not sure if there really are measures to protect themselves from those who are coming in because, you know, it goes both ways. Now, when we talk about 100% safety, 100% health and safety, first of all, what does that even mean? And is it really possible to achieve that level of safety? Mike, I'll start with you on this one. So, so, I mean, the, the word, the word that, that we use in our field is reasonably practicable, which means mm -hmm. that we do enough in our duty of care to, right. to look after us. The, 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 the issue about COVID-19 is that we are going to have to take heightened uh, duty of care in this environment. No different to working in rigs, no, work, no different to working at heights. We are going to need to have really robust ways in which we are dealing with the staff that work at our events, the, the people attending our events, the, the way people move, the way people you know, go about um, an event environment. Um, and the reality is that it's going to take time to get back to where we were, um, you, know, you know, six months ago in, in regards to that. And it's going to take discipline, not only from the event organizer and their chain of, of stakeholders in their business, but it's, it's a holistic approach around everybody's responsibility. You know, we all are responsible for ourselves and we're responsible to others. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that communication is going to have to change in the way that we do things. Uh, we have to right. take care others around us. Um, so, so going back to the issue of whether we can be 100% safe, I don't think you can ever do anything that's 100% safe, but we yeah. have, to, have to have practical solutions to be able to put people together again. Um, and, 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 and they need to be policed and they need to be educated. And, and, mm -hmm. and But I think there's a groundswell that, that people are starting to realize, um, uh, you know, as, 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 as Linda spoke about, where people, where they take responsibility, they, they will be able to, to exercise that control. Thank you very much, Mike. And I'm going to use the same question, but take it just a little bit, uh, one step back and tie it in with the first question. Linda, you mentioned about um, uh, worry that exists 
with uh, with the travelers that they the main worry will be around insurance that insurers are not going to insure travelers or organizations now if it is the insurance that will not insure the travelers in which case they won't travel so does it mean we need the communication we need to if the people whose mindset we need to change and convince is not necessarily the travelers but the insurance companies because if we have to um, if we have to get the insurance companies at a place where they now agree to insure travelers, then it is we need to focus on them when it comes to gaining back their trust. Would you agree with that? And if so, where on earth do we begin? We really have to change the way we're thinking here and not necessarily speaking to the travelers, but speaking to the insurance who are the ones who are going to insure them. Look, what do you really, think about that? Look, we have to tear up the rule book and yeah. rewrite it, okay? Yeah. That, that, let's just look at it that way. Um, mm -hmm. I think insurance, insurers are as confused and as afraid as we are at this moment. <laughs> insurance companies are now, um, I know from the European Union, insurance companies are meeting up and discussing uh, where they go from here and how they go about, uh, about applying new rules. You've got contracts, lawyers going the same way, how they can apply new rules. And even in our industry, how we can work on booking and cancellation and contracts and compensation. But it does depend very much on, again, I'm going back to the same answer I gave in the first communication. For example, um, Portugal is opening up its borders and its airports with Spain, for example, uh, at the end of this month, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks from now. And one of the things that we wanted to do different from the UK, because the UK is actually killing, UK is our major market for Portugal. And it's killing our tourism because of the two week mm -hmm. quarantine that's necessary once you fly back. I myself can't visit my family because I can't afford to spend two weeks in quarantine to go to the mm, UK. Mm -hmm. So what we've done in Portugal is a little bit different. Um, when you arrive in Portugal, you have to have with you a test that you have taken within the last 72 hours, okay? Mm -hmm. Or if not, you have to be willing to be tested at the airport. Those mm -hmm. are the only two options. There right. is no other option, okay? <laughs> That's it. You want, and then of course you don't have to quarantine. You don't have to go into quarantine. You've either got a test that you took in the last 72 hours or you're tested at the airport. Right. Most, most of, the, of the travelers are quite happy to accept this rule. Mm -hmm. I think that everything that you do that not only defends you nationally, but defends the people arriving to visit exactly. you. Exactly. And you communicate it loudly. I don't exactly. see anybody going against it if they know why you're doing it. I exactly. always say, even my kids accept my rules if they know why I'm doing it and I explain it, okay? So people <laughs> will understand this is for their own safety. Um, so I think that um, if we across Europe, across the world, apply similar rules to everyone, because the worst thing that has come out of this pandemic is everyone doing their own thing. Mm -hmm, I cannot yeah. understand or accept that countries are not learning from each other. I cannot understand or accept that, that people are not sitting down and saying, okay, let's think of how we can all apply the same rules everywhere we go. That would go a long way to changing mindsets and mentalities. So we've applied these rules in Portugal. The countries that we are working to build um, air bridges with, like the UK, like Spain, mm -hmm. like France, etc., are accepting them perfectly well. Um, right. Greece, where we've also got bridge, uh, uh, mm -hmm. bridges with, with Greece. And I think that um, insurance companies, uh, law, everyone will... Uh, fall into place once they see what the rules are. I totally agree with Peter and with Mike. There is no vac vaccine that is going to end all this. And yes. there will be another bug just around the corner. I'm, exactly, more yeah. I'm more shocked that we were not, we didn't have a plan in place for this one <laughs> than I am if you tell me there's five more waiting down the line. I kind <laughs> of trusted that my people up there would have a plan in place. So what I think is that we've all learned a lot from this. All of us, the professionals, the companies, the insurance companies, everyone yeah, has learned. Yeah. And we so, will now be better equipped, wiser, and, 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 um, and prepared for the next 
wave or whatever. But it's about countries getting together. It's yeah. about the associations, the professional mm -hmm. associations mm -hmm. speaking mm -hmm. for the industry and implementing yeah. rules for the industry as well. Yeah. Thank you for that, Linda. So what I'm hearing from what you've just said, there's two things here. One collaboration, which has come up before in other sessions. We need to collaborate more. And two, we need to communicate more. And that's the only way that the trust is going to be gained. I really like what you've just said about uh, Portugal, that all you need to do is one, you should have had your test 72 hours prior or be ready to have it at the airport. Now, as you said, people will be more likely to comply if they know that's what they're going to face, rather than you land in Lisbon and next thing you're asked, where is your test? Oh, I don't have one. I didn't know there was a test. Okay, you're also gonna have to take a test now. Oh, sorry, I didn't know that either. So now you have a situation at the airport, but if you communicate beforehand, compliance will just be a breeze. Thank you so much for sharing that. Peter, what are your views in uh, achieving well, we know that there's never going to be 100% safety, but who sets the bar as, as to how safe are you? How safe is your destination? How safe is your airport? What, I mean, who is it that sets the bar and who is going to police that to ensure that we're sure. over -applying? Well, first of all, uh, I want to build on what some of the things that Linda said. Mm -hmm. One, especially, I come from a country whose national sport is suing. And... Um, <laughs> Therefore, people will um, somewhat be very sensitive to the mm. fact that without clear industry standards, yes. they're going to be afraid of lawsuits. Mm -hmm. And right. were they able to maintain um, those particular situations? I mm -hmm. spend a lot of time in the American court system. I'm an expert witness. And the first thing they want to know is, did you follow duty of care? That's the first issue that a uh, lawyer is going to attack on. What does that mean? Yeah. There really are, it, it's not one COVID. There's three or four different levels that we have to think about. There's an economic level. There's a political level. There's a health level. There's an international level. There's an industry level. Now, tourism has the ability to go beyond borders and get beyond regional politics. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, uh, what is the number one goal of a politician? It's to get reelected. He really doesn't care or she doesn't care what else happens. He or she's, their number one goal is to stay in power or to mm -hmm. gain power. So they're going to set things up in a very different way than the universal concept about which Linda spoke. Right. On the other hand, the tourism industry is probably more accurate than the United Nations and bringing people together. And therefore, if we use the tourism industry to set international standards, that's going to protect people and create a resilience that we haven't seen before. Now, there are lots of standards that already exist. For example, we're used to the fact when you got on a plane, they tell you how to put on a seatbelt or should there be a, uh, how to put on an oxygen mask. Nobody freaks out. It's just part of everyday life. You know, you get on a plane, you listen to that. Before I get on a plane, they won't let me on a plane if I don't show my passport. In the same way, it would not be very hard to say, in order to get on a plane, you have to show that you've been tested 72 hours or 24 hours or whatever the rule we want to make. But just like the woman at the, um, at the gatekeeper, the man and the woman at the gatekeeper says, may I see your passport, sir, before they let me on the plane? In the same way, that would solve the problem of even when you get to a place like Lisbon, I already have it. It's documented, put exactly into my um, passport. And by the way, I travel and work a lot in Latin America. And very often I have to show that I have a yellow fever shot. Mm -hmm. but if not, I'm not allowed on the plane. So this isn't something that no one's thought about. These are right. normal types of things that somehow we, we put our brains on hold. Right. And we have to go back and say, one, there are lots of diseases in the world. It's not just COVID-19. How have we handled other diseases? How have we handled SARS? How did we handle a, a H1N1? How did we mm -hmm. handle a Ebola? Yeah, yeah. How, so all these gave us information and it's like we decided to forget about it. Uh, right. How do we handle uh, people who have measles or you know, all sorts of things that we're not thinking about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The one, we need a general health pattern. 
Secondly, we have to show caring. Right. You can get away with almost anything. Uh, I'm going to build on what Linda said. One, she mm -hmm. said that we need to explain even to our children. The right. second part of that is, how do you explain it? With a smile or a frown? Mm -hmm. right. Now, <laughs> tourism is all about hospitality. I have to train police in very difficult situations. And one of the things I tell police officers all the time is, it's not, you know, in French you say, tout c'est dans la présentation. It's not mm -hmm. just what you do, it's how you do it. It's the way you present yourself. We have to teach people within the totality of the tourism industry what good presentation means again. And right. if we do that in a way, then people are not going to resent it. They're going to thank us. If you right. are, a, I teach police, including in Portugal, a mm -hmm. good police officer should be able to give you a ticket right. and, you, and he does such, or she does such a good job that in mm -hmm. the end, the person receiving the ticket says, thank you. Now yeah. that's yeah. kind of classical Jewish guilt, but it's, it, it works. And um, so you have to be able to come up with ways to show people, I care about you. And yes, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad you're, you're bringing that point up. You have to show people I care about you right. because sometimes, you know, the ones who are policing get it wrong because someone comes to you and says, uh, excuse me, you shouldn't be sitting over there or standing over there because of one, two, three. And you look around, you're thinking, wait a minute, everybody else is doing exactly what you're telling me not to do. So how does that work? So you, we need to be able to get the balance right that when you do um, uh, tell someone what to do or, or, or instruct them on what they should be doing, they should feel that you didn't, you know, pick on them and allow everyone else to get away with it. So that should, you know, you know, yeah. you don't want people walking into an airplane or a restaurant and you slap them with a rule and they look around and find, wait a minute, that's not what I'm seeing around. So you can create another problem altogether. So thank you so much for sharing that um linda i have to say there's a comment or rather a question that has come up and i'd like to address that to you before we continue in the q a session um we have lola adefope who says linda what do we tell passengers before boarding even more pertinent how should parents prepare for children heading back to school in international destinations i don't know if you want to handle that i don't know if i mean that was addressed to you but any one of the panelists can pick on that one if they feel they want to I'm quite happy to, to touch on that, although I'm not mm -hmm. an expert in children, but I, I, I have, there's a lot of children around me all the time. Um, I think that children are much more resilient uh, than, than adults very often. Um, mm -hmm. And it is exactly as Peter said, it's not what you say, it's right. how you say it. Mm -hmm. Children perfectly understand our nurseries and primary schools are open again. And the creativity, the creativity of the teachers has been amazing. I was just right. watching um, uh, on the news this, this school in, in the north of Portugal where the teachers created a hat that looks like a lock, an octopus that every child personifies. And the, the, uh, the hat measures how far you have to be from your friend because it has these octopus arms, you know, and, and the children are enjoying doing that. They can understand that it's to stop them not getting ill and then it's stop them not making their grandma ill mm -hmm. and it's only temporary and it's about not impacting the fear not continue we tend to go into a panic mode and, and right. not talk things through but rather to transmit a fear you know you're not mm -hmm. you it's not the right thing to grab children away from other adults or whatever it's about <laughs> coming down to their size and telling them and, uh, about how to do things. We, we, I've seen people invent absolutely amazing, creative ways of mm -hmm. greeting people without having right. to touch them. Uh, mm -hmm. Look, it's mm -hmm. all doable. Please do not right. make a mountain out of a molehill. Mm -hmm. It's about mm -hmm. continually communicating, smiling, right. and doing it in, a, in an affirmative and positive way. It right, right. Works. I am the worst person in the world. I am <laughs> always forgetting my mask. So I go all the way down in my building, go to the door, then get told. Someone says to me, your mask, your mask. And I have to come back up again. And then I say, thank you so much. Thank you for protecting yeah. me. We right. have to do it in a nice way. We have to do it in a nice way. 
Thank you very much for that, Linda. Lola, I hope that answers your question. And may I just say at this point, if anybody else has a question, feel free to put it in the Q&A box and we'll address it as we go along. Now, this next question, I'm going to address it to you, Mike. Um, well, we are right now, obviously, this, this session is beside Africa. So Africa is a, is, a, is a very viable destination, particularly for leisure, incentives, and events. Now, we do need the industry to bounce back. I mean, that is like yesterday. Someone said earlier in another session that if we were ready to start to get back to business again, we would do it yesterday. Now, there have been several conversations around airlines and airports complying with health and safety, but we cannot forget other players in the supply chain. And here I'm talking about the DMCs, the incentive houses, the, uh, the event uh, planners, fleet owners, you know, support services such as AV and translation services, etc. What will they need to do? in order to comply with the health and safety protocols and what do they need to do in order to regain the confidence of travelers and buyers because you know it's not just about the airline it's not just about the airport because you know you've now landed in 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 kigali then what you've traveled safely you've gone through the airport safely but then what what will you know the other people in the supply chain need to do in order to comply with the health and safety measures mike yeah i think i'm um, having traveled extensively through africa um uh, you know, we, we were involved in Nigeria when Ebola was busy breaking West Africa and so forth. I, I think um, Linda touched on it. We, we can't be fearful of, of what the yeah. situation is, but each mm -hmm. party along the way has to provide um, extra steps. So we no longer can just rely on someone else to say, okay, well, they're the leader. So you get to the airport, they do their thing. We actually then right. need to take to the next step. So, mm -hmm. you know, recently coming from Kigali, they were one of the first countries prior to lockdown that, you know, you, you met someone with, a, with an iPad, they went through everything with you. They captured your data. And that was only being done in, in, in that kind of environment. Not many other people had, had done that. But you leave the airport, and then everything falls down again. So, so therefore, the supply chain, um, both bottom end and top end, all need to come together. So you know, your venues need to take a lead in, in what they're doing. And, and it's not about a cost and what's it's going to cost. And it's about implementing steps that talk about your environment. Right. Your environment, protecting those yeah. that are servicing your environment, and then exactly. taking on that boundary and then mm -hmm. and then and, and and this is a great opportunity for awareness you know we talk a lot about safety in health and safety right, right. but you know, when you go back to the who documentations around pandemics and mass gatherings they've been warning us about this years ago it's mm -hmm. only now we're starting to read this documentation and it's starting to play front of mind awareness that 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 the, the, these practical steps are already in place so i think mm -hmm. you know we're in the health back into health and safety and and we're having to concentrate on that uh, around that and awareness and training and, and hygiene is probably the biggest thing that we can learn from an, from an African point of view and take right. ownership of, of that. And, and that's something, you know, that I would like to see in my travels throughout Africa is just, mm -hmm. you know, everybody kind of no longer leaving it to someone else to do. Right. Thank you very much for that, Mike. I hope any other Africans who are on this panel or who are listening on in and can, you know, take some pointers on that one because it's really, really important. Because if your airline has complied, your airport has complied, then everybody else has got to comply and really show that they are complying. And more importantly, not just to uh, safeguard the ones who you are hosting, but also the ones who are servicing the ones you're hosting. That's so very important. Now, I have a question here from uh, Chike Ohiagu. He did not direct this question to anyone in particular, but he does say, um, how do, he's asking, how do we guard against the issue of falsified tests and results? Now, hmm. That's a pretty uh, deep question. So if anyone would like to handle that, Peter, perhaps you might want to. I mean, is there such a thing as falsified tests and results? Yeah, well, I think what he means, I, I saw the question, and mm -hmm. I, that could be read in two ways. It could either right. mean that you get a false positive or a false negative, uh -huh. okay. which is not a falsified result. It just means that the test did not give you the correct information. Mm -hmm. And the other would be that somebody actually falsified a document to make it look well, yeah. um, mm -hmm. uh, that you were negative when it really came back positive. Mm -hmm. So the second form is clearly not only fraud, but mm -hmm. it would be um, illegal. And yeah. you would assume that there would be some form of um, legal police procedure that would be taken just like if I falsified a passport or I falsified any other you know, tax document. 
I'm going to assume he didn't mean that. I'm going to assume he meant the other side, which is false negatives and false positives. Right. Um, if it's a false positive, okay, uh, the person just won't travel. So that's not a big real I issue. The real issue would be a false negative. And there may be ways that, that are going to have to be thought through. First of all, testing is getting better. I mean, was, when we started, there were a lot of false uh, negatives. That percentage has gone down radically. We are hoping within the next two weeks or so that we'll mm -hmm. be uh, able to work on new forms of tests. They're being worked on both in Boston, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and at Bar Ilan University in Israel, they will give 100% non-false negatives. So right. that, that would eliminate that problem or will be eliminated very soon. The other side of that is secondary testing. Uh, the key element of all forms of security is redundancy. So um, if you are, if, we, if that does appear to be a problem, then we might demand to see the cert certificate before you get on a plane or a bo boat. But then also when you get off, we just say we're going mm -hmm. to retest everyone again. But if you're going to do that, you've got to have a preparation. What happens if that comes up that way? In other words, I got on the plane, I believed I was 100% okay, everybody mm -hmm. else on the plane was okay, and now my negative is now questioned, is it a false negative? Mm -hmm. Okay, now what do I do? It, do, I, do you send me back? Well, if I'm British, how are you gonna send me back for two weeks quarantine? <laughs> do you keep me in Lisbon and who pays for that? Right. Mm -hmm, um, exactly, yeah. So this is the type of policies, and this is what I mean that when, when I say that there's not just one issue. There's a political issue, an economic issue, a um, security issue. One of the things in security we had long worried about is what happened if someone used a form of uh, bio, uh, biological warfare. They walk through an airport with smallpox when most of the world mm -hmm. is not prepared to deal with smallpox. Mm -hmm. So these are things that we have to begin to really think through. And in a sense, COVID might be a blessing because right. a lot of the stuff that from perspective of security, we kind of chose, and I think Mike pointed that out. There were major speeches given in 2005, George Bush, um, President George Bush in 2005 gave a major speech to the US Congress saying that expect something, he didn't know the name COVID, but mm -hmm. expect a major outbreak and everybody ignored it. Bill Gates did the same thing and everyone ignored it. So what we need to do now is take COVID as a wake up call and say, how are we going to intertwine security with safety, with health? In the English language, we use the word surety. Surety mm -hmm. is the point where safety, security, health, economics, and reputation come together. And with mm -hmm. reputation, you can almost mean um, uh, fear and confidence. Uh, right. So if, you, if we begin to think in a surety pattern, rather than a safety or security pattern. Mm -hmm. But then we see those five elements combining. That's going to allow governments and other people to really develop it. And again, I want to emphasize the people mm -hmm. who are going to have to be leaders are not going to be national governments. It's not going to be the UN. It's right. not going to be the European Union. It's going to have to be the tourism industry. Because that mm -hmm. is the one non-political industry where mm -hmm. no, we're not worried about elections, or who's, we're worried about only people and human qual and quality of life. Right. And that Africa, is very profound, that's essential. Yeah. That is very profound that you should say that. And I, I, I do believe not only in Africa, but across the world, that the tourism uh, ministries and the tourism leaders, they are aware of that and they're doing all they need to do right now and putting measures in place to actually start taking uh, leadership in that area. It's going to be a long journey, but we're going to get started on it. Now, following on, on what you've just said, Peter, you've recently been involved in putting together what is known as the COVID uh, resilience zones. Right. Perhaps now is the right time for you to, you know, talk to us about it. Three to five minutes, if you could just talk to us about this initiative, because I believe for those who haven't heard of it, it'll be something that's very interesting to hear about and possibly implement in our destination. Yes. So one, we notice we use zones in that countries yeah. because mm -hmm. lots of times you could have one part of a country could have a problem and another part of a country could not. A smaller country, the whole country might be a zone. But if you're mm -hmm. talking about Brazil or you're talking mm -hmm. about Colombia or you're mm -hmm. talking about uh, Kenya or you're talking about South Africa, those are big countries that cover a lot of areas. 
So we need to think in zone levels rather than um, country levels. That means that we may need to also have some sort of documentation saying, I came from, I'm just making this up. Let's just say that Cape Town is a, a resilient zone and right. they, where they have a um, good hospital system, a good testing system, uh, a way that we can care for people when they're there, um, we're able to publicize it, then we may be able to say, okay, you're traveling to Portugal. Maybe Portugal doesn't necessarily want everyone from South Africa, but if you're coming right. from Cape Town, Cape mm -hmm. Town is a resilient zone that's allowing people to say, I've been in just Cape Town and I'm okay. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm a very different situation. So maybe we're gonna have to start changing a little bit, not just thinking at national levels, but also zo zonatic levels. I just made that mm -hmm. word up. Um, mm -hmm. Secondly, um, a resilient zone means not only thinking about solving a problem, but stopping problems before they exist. That right. means right okay. now we are working on a reactive methodology. We're mm -hmm. not working on a proactive methodology. Mm -hmm. Are we, for example, making sure that people have plenty of water? Are right. they getting vitamin D? Um, are we using the sun as a disinfectant, which is probably the most accurate disinfectant that we have? Um, getting people to go to the beach. I realize it's winter in South Africa, so you're probably not running to the beach. But um, in the Northern Hemisphere, it's, it's summer and it's warm. We can use that as a, you know, as a great methodology. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, resilient zones mean that you don't have just the tourism ministry or the health ministry or the police. You're getting groups working together mm -hmm. in a way that they're intercooperating. And the more cooperation you have in, in, in communication you have between ministries, private industry, you cannot longer just have public sector and private sector. They're now intertwined. Like it or not, the private sector and the public sector have to help each other. Right. Without the private sector, there's no money. Mm -hmm. Without the public sector, you don't have legislation and policy. So you need right. to be able to interconnect those two. And if we can so create that, then we, become, we have the resilience to deal with any problem that comes along the way. So these are being tried out. One of the mm -hmm. places that is really looking at it very strongly, and I'm very lucky, um, I work with the government of Jamaica um, mm -hmm. to um, develop a Jamaica uh, safety and security surety across Jamaica. Minister mm -hmm. Bartlett, Edmund Bartlett of Jamaica, has created mm -hmm. now a center for the study of resilience mm -hmm. and how tourism can make itself resilient no matter what the problem has to be. And resilience, right. mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what you give me, I, I have the strength to push it back and move forward. And if we, and that means we need listings of what are strengths, our weaknesses, yeah. Yeah. developing SWOT analysis, which is you know strengths, mm -hmm. weaknesses, opportunities, um, and threats and finding ways to create a tourism industry that's going to go well beyond COVID right. will see as a entrance way to a much better tourism industry than we ever had right. before. Thank you. So from what I'm hearing from that is that with these resilience zones, not just about COVID, but as Linda pointed out earlier, that it is inevitable that another disaster is going to come at Absolutely. some point. So once we have these resilience zones in place, then we'll be more prepared to push back and rather not be caught by surprise as we have been caught this time around. So if we haven't learned anything, maybe we should just learn that, that it is time to put resilience zones that will pretty much be ready for anything, pretty much anything that may come our way, short of a tsunami, can't speak. Dars, from your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> Amen to that. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, Linda, we have, a, although you've already touched on this, but I'd like to come back to you on the issue of Portugal. Now, as you said earlier, Portugal has been one of the very first countries in the world, if not, um, well, over and above the EU, to open up its doors. Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, gradually resume business events, something that we all want to do in our areas. So, now, the rest of the world sees Portugal as a positive case study. You've already told us what you're doing at the airports. Could you share with us another one or two points about uh, what it is that Portugal has done to really, really make this, um, you know, this success story 
and make this transition so successful. Because while the rest of the world is scrambling, trying to think about what they need to do, you're already <laughs> doing it. You and Tanzania. <laughs> Okay, I don't want to, to portray us as the, the saints of, of, of the industry. Um, the fact is that one, as Peter originally said, one of the things that allowed Portugal to be able to come back earlier as well is this element of trust and this element of union. The government, mm -hmm. the opposition parties, the church, um, the academia, industry right. and the associations mm -hmm. all immediately got together to find right. solutions. Okay, mm -hmm. so we know that there's a problem. What's the solution? And in fact, um, we have very, very strict laws and rules in place about occupation numbers and, and procedures of entering venues, of being in venues, of etc. And we started, um, the largest event we've had uh, so far is a concert, 1,000 people. Um, but in a venue that is usually for my, many more than that, with the President of the Republic in, in the room, leading the show. He led the way to show that it's, it's safe. But yes, mm -hmm. we're starting with business events. We're not starting right. with ex exhibitions yet. Mm -hmm. um, September is our... Um, we're solidly booked from September to December. Wow. Okay, so wow. I mean, it's it, because a lot of events wow. were postponed. Um, yeah. A lot of our international events were postponed because mm -hmm. they're back uh, from right. September. Mm -hmm. We're focusing, we're getting ready for, for hybrid events because mm -hmm. we don't know if there's going to be a second wave or not. So right. we're, we've got plan A and plan mm -hmm. B. Plan B mm -hmm. is hybrid events with the nationals right. going to market. The nationals mm -hmm. have shown a great level of trust just as they were compliant to go indoors they have listened to the government uh, buy portuguese go to the shop stay home attend yeah. events etc and mm -hmm. so people are booking for events they're booking concerts they're buying tickets they're, they're beginning to 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 go out and right. so one of the things we have uh, as i said just uh, when we opened up, the rules were already in place and everybody has to do it. Uh, the right. Prime Minister uh, said exactly that. The mm -hmm. moment we see that you're not doing it, we just close the economy again. So wow. It's your choice. Okay. It's your mm -hmm. responsibility. It's your choice. Okay, right. so from, we have rules for the small, we have rules in place for mm -hmm. uh, establishments up to 200 meters establishments right. up to 400 meters establishments up to a thousand meters and then over a thousand meters each one has its own rules we mm -hmm. have the hygiene rules in place from the moment you enter to what you touch what you do everyone has to be trained in order to receive the seal that allows you to hold events mm -hmm. which is the clean mm -hmm. safe seal which is managed by right. the National Tourism Board. Uh -huh. Okay, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Who, um, they have just contracted another 1,500 inspectors to make sure that things are wow. inspected and that trust is maintained, okay? Mm -hmm. Our so, Linda, if I may just ask you there, is the National yes. Tourism Board a private or a... Is it, government. Is it a private? It's government, government, okay. Government. Right, okay. It's the voice mm -hmm. of the government to manage, right. inspect, and finance tourism. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. our tourism board um, uh, gives out the seal. It applies right. tests and, and then inspects and then monitors and then follows up. Uh, right. You mm -hmm. have to have the seal. You have to have a clean and safe seal. Mm -hmm, Your mm -hmm. staff has to be trained. Right. Yeah, they, can, they can just pop in any time out of the room right. and make sure that you're doing it right. Um, the venues, the, the, the organizers, mm -hmm. it, it works on both, on both sides. Right. It goes from everything to the car park, to the bathrooms, well, to food, yeah. safety. Wow. We are not allowed to have uh, served food. Every, every piece of food has to be hermetically sealed. When you go into a restaurant, as you sit mm -hmm. down, the table is empty. And then right. everything is put on the table once you are mm -hmm. there. The table wow. is disinfected. Okay. You cannot mm -hmm. sit anywhere else. If you get up, your mask goes on. Okay? If you're sitting down, your mask can come mm -hmm. off. And Do you still have buffet lines? Do you still have buffets? No buffets. No <laughs> buffets. Everything is served to you. Um, right. Everything is hermetically sealed. Everything from cutlery to glasses mm -hmm. to everything is put on the table after right. you are there. 
and have right. easy. This applies for everything, really. It's a lot of rules. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you them all. But the I rules apply imagine. from everything, from entering the venue to mm -hmm. the staff, to the accreditation area, how we hand out things, how we right. do the accreditation, how mm -hmm. people enter a room, where they sit. Mm -hmm. Once you are sitting down and your bum is on that chair, you can mm -hmm. never sit anywhere else. That's <laughs> it. That is your home for the whole day. Or for, that is your chair. If we have breakout rooms, there has to be half an hour between each session so that mm -hmm. everything is disinfected and you get an army wow. of people coming in with all the PPE and everything is disinfected. The rules are very strict. Mm. So we, we have to yeah, have yeah. this training to learn. Yes. It. But it's worth it because it is. business events are business yeah. accelerators. They accelerate mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. economy. We have to have them. It's the first thing any country should open up is business events. Absolutely. They accelerate the economy. They're going to guarantee that we return. That's yes. the economy comes back, that we defend mm -hmm. employment, and that we right. defend businesses. So put those rules in place, make sure people obey them, and get right. the business events going. Because without business events, there is no economy. Absolutely. Totally agree with you. I mean, putting the rules and making sure that they are followed with consequences if you are not, because, you know, human beings are human beings. When they know they can get away with it, then they won't do it. And next thing you know, the confidence goes right down the pan. There is no 100% safety. That's impossible. Exactly. But there never, was. Yeah. there never was. Even before COVID, there was no 100% safety. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what mm -hmm. we have to do is do everything that we can to make sure mm -hmm. that we are as safe as right. possible within the knowledge that we have at this time. Mm. Now for the business events, what are you doing in terms of audio visual, in terms of your microphones and things like that and your, uh, your translation equipment? I mean, what do you do with those? We, the, you know. same, the same rules apply. Uh, mm. The same rules apply. Anytime mm -hmm. any person changes over, everything is right. disinfected. I okay. think the public is now used to being sitting down and every mm -hmm. time a panel changes, a whole mm -hmm. horde of people go up on stage <laughs> and disinfect everything. I think everybody <laughs> accepts that. It's not, it's not a thing anymore. It's just yeah. a normal. It's a new normal. It's a new normal. Not only do they, they, yeah, they expect to see it. In fact, if they don't see it, they get worried. So, yes. yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can <laughs> only take your mask off once you are on stage and sitting mm -hmm. in, your, in your seat. We respect the rule of distancing on stage. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. We have hybrid events. So international speakers are now speaking in to the conference via, via web, of course. Right. And the national, mm -hmm. for example, I'm hosting an event in two weeks where mm -hmm. I'm hosting it live from right. where I am, from the stage okay. with mm -hmm. two speakers and the moderator. But right. the international speakers are online and our audience mm -hmm. is national. So. Wonderful. Wonderful. And we have many comments here supporting exactly what you've said. Um, Frank's saying that's very important. Linda, rules have to be in place and they have to be followed. So there's no point of putting rules that are going to be broken. Thank you very much. We've learned a lot from what Portugal are doing. Can I and just say, a very, it's obligatory to have every event mm -hmm. must have a safety officer on site. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely yeah. obligatory. It's now one person who is responsible for monitoring all the mm -hmm. safety protocols. Right. Okay, just a question very quickly here. You said that when people arrive at the airport in Lisbon, they, either you bring your own tests, 72 hours, or you agree to be tested. Now, if someone is tested and found to be positive, what happens? What do you do with that person? It's at the airport. Don't, I don't... We have an isolation area. The airport right. has an isolation. I haven't been through the experience personally, mm -hmm. so I'm only speaking at what I mm -hmm. have been communicated to. Right. So we, mm -hmm. have, we have an isolation area. The person mm -hmm. immediately uh, it goes into isolation. We have track and tracing in place. The mm -hmm. rules are now set. I don't know the rules yet, but I'm waiting to be right. told. We have track and trace from the moment the person mm -hmm. steps on the plane at the other end, at the other destination. Mm -hmm. okay. We have track and trace. If the person tests positive, we take mm -hmm. responsibility our end. We right. have isolation areas. Uh, mm -hmm. they, uh, they, they are not sent home. They're, they're, they're put into quarantine. The Portuguese mm -hmm. government has opted to do that. Uh, right. it, is, it is their option. And, um, and the, the track and trace rules will now be uh, shared with everybody. Um, they've just been finalized because it takes a lot of um, government entities to come to this uh, to this conclusion. So they're now Lovely. being put into place. 
Yeah, thank you very much for that. Now, wow, time has flown really, really quickly and we, we have to wrap this session up. But before we go, Mike, there's a question here for you. It's from Alistair Steed. And he's saying, he's asking, in terms of business events and exhibitions, one of the challenges is build up and break down times. Absolutely, I can possibly understand that. And turning around time of venues. I know we talked about this in terms of turning around time of the uh, air, uh, aircraft, but now Alistair is asking about turnaround time of the venues. So what are your thoughts on this with regards to COVID-19 and how um, can we deal with this? Mike? Yeah, so, so um, Doris, we've been working very closely with the South African Event Council in South Africa. Um, mm -hmm. The associations that they've come together, they're talking to one another um, as one as one voice, uh, which is really good. We've uh, you know looked at our global partners with regards to the messaging and so forth. But the, the, the practicality of all of this is that what we knew before is not going to be the normal going forward. The idea of mm -hmm. tight times that put people's lives and safety at risk in the first place is is something that should have been addressed years ago and will be addressed now. Everything takes longer. Um, you go shopping, you go anywhere, everything just takes one more step than what we used to. So, you know, mm -hmm. some of the our reopening guidelines is we don't want to see 24 hour um, uh, build up periods anymore. We are gonna have to shut our venues. We are gonna have to clean. The idea of a cost implication of COVID-19, there will be cost implications. We can't get around them. In, and, and as Linda has, exper uh, uh, as it, has showed us, there is a means to an end and, and that means unfortunately we have to do certain things to get that done so i think what will happen is over time we will stretch out everything we will have the time to stretch out everything um, and then as time goes by over uh, you know 24 36 months we'll kind of get back into how we used to do things but i foresee you know a lot of more responsibility being taken um you know within that build and breakdown period that 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 should have been happening you know from a, from an african point of view um you know already and it, it hasn't really been okay hello oh sorry thanks mike <laughs> thanks very much for that um well as i said the time has gone so fast and we really need to be wrapping up right now but peter i am going to have to give you the last word on this and um Really, what are your final thoughts? We know that you have a lot of experience in terms of uh, health, safety, and security. And I also know there's a lot more you could tell us about the uh, uh, COVID resilience zones, sure. but I'm not going to tie you on what could be your final words. Please share with us what you think as Africa and African businesses, what, what are the two things or three things that we really, really need to consider and put in place when it comes to health and safety? Okay. Well, that's a really very profound question. And hopefully I can come up with the profundity of an answer to equal to the profundity of your question. Um, I'm very honored to be part of the African Tourism Board. Mm -hmm. And um, my job there is uh, to be the advisor to African nations as far as mm -hmm. safety and security go. So obviously I could speak about this for days and you don't have yeah. the time, nor does anyone have to listen to me. <laughs> so let me put in a few things. One, we need to maintain hope. Mm -hmm. Without a sense of hope, nothing's going to happen. The materials and the technology that we have today is not going to be the technology that we have tomorrow. Humanity has a tremendous capability of coming up with technology to solve problems as they need to be done. Secondly, we can't fight yesterday's battles. We have to be wise enough to begin to think through what are going to be some of the challenges in the future and how are we going to prepare ourselves to be resilient in dealing with future challenges uh, rather than fighting yesterday's battles. So mm -hmm. we want to conquer yesterday's battles, but be prepared and be resilient for whatever might be coming in the future. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, I have tremendous hope and um, confidence that Africa will be one of the shining stars of the future. Mm -hmm. It's a continent that has everything. It has beautiful scenery, it has wonderful beaches, it has great culture, it has unique cuisine. It's, it's a tourism mecca. What yeah, yeah. Africa needs to work on now is the structure and the organizational policies that it will allow it to take what it's had in the past 
and create a future that will be brighter, not only for its own people, but for people around the world. And if mm -hmm. Africa can do that, then it will be one of the, it was, people believe that humanity began in Africa right. uh, many, many tens of thousands of years ago. And you know what? Humanity will grow from Africa and we will all be wiser, lucky, and smarter because of what can be developed across the continent in the helping of people throughout the entire world. So hope, technology, mm -hmm. and creativity are the three right. goals that we need to think through. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You've summed it up so well. Technology, hope, and creativity. So all of you on the, uh, who have joined us who are in those areas, take note and take action. Thank you so very much. We have come to the end of our session. May I just say thank you, a big thank you to all of our panelists. Linda, as always, thank you so much. Mike, thank you so much for all your insights as an event at PCO myself. I mean, I'm definitely going to take point of all of those things that you have mentioned. As for you, Peter, wow, always a pleasure to hear what you have to say. And hopefully we, we shall have you all again at another panel. Tess, over to you now. Thank you so very much. Bye-bye. Oh, Até logo. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you. Um, this, this was such a fascinating talk and, and fascinating speakers. Thank you so much everybody for taking the time. It's been a long day. It's been a megathon of a webinar. Um, and I think we've learned an incredible, an incredible amount of new information today and new ways of doing things. Um, I mean, the creativity and the innovation has been phenomenal that's come out of this group. What I also found really encouraging, which was kind of the objective of this whole meeting, is the sense of collaboration and the need to collaborate and the fact that I don't think there was a single person on any panel that does not feel the need to collaborate but do it in a meaningful way. Um, so the time is now. The sooner that we start holding hands and, and working together, the sooner we'll actually achieve a lot of things, solve a lot of problems, and the sooner we can actually open for business and get economies and trade um, you know, kickstarted again and start eradicating the poverty that is busy taking over a lot of our communities. So finally, I'd just like to say thank you to some of the people. I've noticed uh, the, the um, participants on the side. There are a few people, including yourself, Doris, has been here right from the start. So well done and thank you for sticking with us for those who could. I hope this has been meaningful to everybody that's been listening in whichever session that you managed to attend. We'll be sharing this video um, as soon as I can, can get it downloaded and I'll chop it into bite-sized chunks and, and share it out uh, during the course of the day, tomorrow and the weekend. And then just finally, again, to everybody who participated today, especially our moderators and our speakers, we know time is precious under the circumstances. Um, a thank you, a heartfelt thank you from myself and from Site Africa and from Site Global for sharing your knowledge and your time. And with that, good afternoon, good night, good morning. Have a fantastic day. See you soon. Bye, Tess. <laughs>